there's loads for us to do in terms of not just acceptance, but much more about around education and coaching philosophies and, and changing the societal structure around sport. Because you can have an athlete who is striving and is so successful on the pitch, right, or on the court, but in their life, they're struggling. So Hilary, welcome to the podcast. My first question is, how did your journey begin in terms of supporting athletes? How did that become a, a drive for you? Yeah, um, well, first, I appreciate being here, so thank you. Um, and, you know, I think my experience is probably not different than most that kind of enter into the field, being a competitive, you know, youth athlete and collegiate athlete, like, sport has been a part of my world probably since I was four, right, is when I first started competing. And, you know, I think through the process of multi-sport experience, different highs and lows of what I experienced as a youth, you know, coming through injuries and successful outcomes and transition to moving to different locations with different coaches. I had a pretty pivotal moment, like when I was 14, um, the environment I went to like became easy for me and it kind of sounds weird and cliche, um, but like winning wasn't fun anymore. The success that I was having wasn't pushing me to the level that I used to have. Um, and then through just different training modalities, I had gotten injured. And I think all that time as an adolescent, what you go through in formations, I really was seeking someone to talk to. Um, the irony of all this is my mother is a counselor and she's a therapist and she probably would have been a great resource to talk to. But at the time, 14, 15 year old me was like, I don't want my mom and I didn't want to go to therapy with someone who didn't understand the competitive mindset. And so I kind of knew early on at 14, like I want to be that person who can engage with athletes, who can understand the competitive world, who can really help them succeed in and out of sport. That launched me into just being curious about what sport does for people and kind of the, the process of connecting with others and helping people. Why do you think there's a, a limitation towards that area around mindset and performance? You mentioned your past experiences and mm -hmm. how that um, could have been coped more better and the strategies that we are more aware of now are, are used to help athletes today. Why do you think there's maybe a limitation in terms of knowledge there and, and can you justify that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for sure going into, going into my educational studies and even the path that I embarked on knowing what I wanted to do was great at 14 and I stuck to that path to a T. It wasn't easy even in the educational domains of creating new routes of my niche focus of mental health and athletes and looking at the dynamics of um, the coaching philosophies and coaching practices. Like I, I did everything. I was a at collegiate athlete. I then was coaching. You know, I got that aspect of the world and then I went into mental skills coaching and then brought in that into the clinical aspect of the process. And and everything remained the same is we don't approach this with an preventative mindset. It's much more an intervention based approach. It's reactive. Um, there was so many roadblocks and obstacles going into the process of even acceptance and utilizing this as a way of a teaching modality for our athletes and, and helping, you know, younger athletes learn these life lessons, these life skills, these coping skills to thrive, to minimize the burnout, depression, anxiety, that comes within being a successful athlete, you know? So I think there's loads for us to do in terms of not just acceptance, but much more about around education and coaching philosophies and, and changing the societal structure around sport. So you kind of mentioned all those different elements and I, I get the feeling that maybe culture is a key element within that. Um, yeah. You mentioned competitive environments and coaches might have an outlook on wanting to win. You mentioned drive and extrinsic rewards and that feeling of success and what that success might feel like might be something that causes maybe uh, mental fatigue, but also mental challenges after performance. Is there anything that you've worked upon within that area around culture and, and kind of uh, outlook towards success and outlook towards the, the journey within your practice? Yeah, you know, I think my my professional domain and focus has really evolved. When I first came in, it was around um, life skills and youth sport and these preventive measures. And and then I really owned that I was a clinical sports psychologist and mental health was my niche area. And, and I pretty made it um, an embark around 2018 when I spoke about the toxic culture of sport and kind of naming the things that we didn't want to name. And you know, I think that the challenge is when we when we bring out the negative aspects and we say some of these things are wrong within our cultural system with how we coach our athletes, how we speak to our athletes, the environments we place them in, 
um, it's a challenge because it seems like I'm negative and I don't love sport, which is the opposite. Like I think sport is um, amazing. There's so many benefits from it, from the cohesion aspect, the collective, even the outcomes of winning the success, the pride that you gain from that and pushing your limits. It's, it's amazing that the body can do, um, but, but the preparation of actually coaching the mental aspect is huge. And I think the culture, like, and I really kind of have this tagline of creating a culture of care for culture champions, right? If we have to do better in a cultural environment to create psychological safety and security, to enable athletes to thrive, to minimize the harm and risks that we're doing for them mentally and emotionally. Um, we even see the physical aspects of how we used to push athletes at the physical level. And we have much more awareness in terms of load management and the process of the sport science changing based on the data we get from the physical components of athletes. And you see it changing across multiple professional domains, right? You know, the NBA and, and, and soccer or football, as we might call it, right, is very keen on load management and looking at the aspects of the physical elements. And I think we just are a little bit behind on understanding the mental and emotional fatigue that goes in that and the rehab process and, and treating that the same way that we do with a physical level and and beyond that, just how we treat humans, right? These are people, and I like to say my aspect is is treating the the person within the player, right? Teaching the human aspect of them so they can thrive in and out of the field. Toxicity. I think that was the kind of the, the term yeah. that you used. Yeah. Can you define can you describe what that might look like and how that might be challenged in terms of maybe the practices that we are aware of today? Can you can you describe maybe a little bit of an outline for those that might be listening or watching. Yeah, when I think of like the toxic culture sport, I think of um, sport is a microcosm of our society, right? It represents a lot of what's going on. And we have this unique term, bracketed morality, where we kind of put this moral pause button on the morals and the conduct of behavior in sport, right? We allow things to occur in sport that we would never allow to occur in an academic setting, in a traditional work setting, uh, even in human interactions. Um, so for example, the way that we speak to individuals when we're asking them to perform something, like the, the words and the language that we use can be really negative and uh, harmful and um, borderline verbal abuse, right? That if those things were said in a different context, we would immediately try to take action, but we allow dance for it because negative punishment, negative motivation is a, is a reinforcer, it's a motivator. And, and so that's how athletes have been trained, that in this environment, you are strong, you are stoic, you don't display weakness. Um, you can have a certain emotional range. And we coach to that through the intensity and aggression and the nature of how we speak to them. I think in other terms, when we look at uh, the conduct behavior that occurs, there's some pretty maladaptive bad behavior that occurs in sport, right? Whether it's on field in terms of like um, performance enhancement drugs, doping, things of that nature, cheating scandals, or we look at off field behavior that occurs, whether it's sexual assault, physical assault, uh, things that occur that um, the punishment, the accountability is not the same playing field as it would be in normal human life and society functions. And so these are things that are like we need to shift and be better. Like just because you're an athlete at a high domain and you're successful and you have accolades does not allow you the invincibility to act differently and have a different frame of conduct. And so that's that's the negative side of things of the the behaviors we allow to exist, the way we shape those and, and enable those to exist, the lack of accountability and structure. Do you, think, do you think that there might be a little bit of a limitation in terms of exit strategies as well? Have you come across anything al along those lines in terms of the... You kind of mentioned the culture and the kind of the, the ethical uh, negative processes that might occur, but also maybe exit strategies if those that are trying to fulfill a career in elite performance but don't necessarily make it and the statistics show that the majority of us don't make it as elite performers. Is there anything on maybe exit strategies and providing a little bit more of a player care emphasis there? Yeah, anything that I think that there? Even that speaks to the toxic culture, right? If you are not performing or producing, we can see a lot of cultures maybe unconsciously doing this, but ignoring those athletes, not coaching them the same way, not providing the same structure, not believing in these athletes to be successful, not giving them an opportunity, right? So when you have an athlete who is working day in and day out at that level and doesn't get the right opportunity and, and doesn't get noticed, that will impact their self-esteem, their self-worth. And it almost pushes athletes out, right? Maybe early retirement, moving to a lower tiered um, competitive environment. And, you know, the transition is not set up for success, right? We're not transitioning off and providing opportunities and making sure that they're okay. 
um, and I can't be black and white. There are systems that are meant to help with retirement and like services provided in organizations. But I think the issue is once an athlete like leaves the system that they're in, there's no follow-up care. There's like, hey, we have this website you can go to and you can maybe take this course and we're here if you reach out to us. The athlete is so emotionally like working through their own grief process of transition. They're not in a place to retain, who do I contact when I need help? Where can I get some information? How can I still have my supportive structure that I had? You know, they're they're trying to live a new life and their routines are completely different. And so that is a for sure other area that maybe isn't as extreme as the toxic culture, but it definitely is an impact that's impacting the security and safety of our athletes. It's interesting how you mentioned the identity shift of a of a of a professional athlete or even a, a maybe someone you mentioned lower leagues as well of they they are recognized as that person that is they the football player and they have the instagram that kind of assembles and and relates towards that and then all of a sudden they that's snatched away and taken away from them and their ego is very much aligned with them being a football player and that adjustment can cause significant challenges is there anything that you've come across within that area around how to cope with that so the people for example that there might be people watching or listening to this that uh relate to that currently at the moment and is there anything that you can might be able to suggest to to support them within that process of of that transition because i can imagine that there's a range of different factors like like i said that kind of aligns to their personality aligns to their identity but that has to significantly change for them to maybe transition away Mm -hmm. I do view it like a grief, right? As as much as I try and, you know, I was taught this at an early age too, and sport is what you do. It's not who you are, right? Like that's great, but we don't believe in that, right? That's not true. It's, it's also the same cliche platitude of it's okay to not be okay. Like I love those phrases, but it's never really okay to not be okay. We don't have environments set up for that. We we don't have the bandwidth emotionally ourselves to actually take on someone else's emotional burden unless you're trained in that, right? We don't really care how you're doing. We just say, hey, how are you? Good, good. We don't express where we're at. So trying to tell an athlete growing up, like you are more than your sport. Yes. And the athlete will identify this, especially if they've been doing sport their entire life and at the crux of their identity formation, it becomes a part of who they are. And so when you transition out, it really is grieving the loss of that identity, making meaning of what it meant to you, processing it as if you were losing a loved portion of yourself, right? And and making meaning of it, redefining who you will become, you know, moving forward. And the preventative skills are finding hobbies and interests outside of sport, right? Having sport be one component of you that is amazing, but what are other components, whether you're a father, you're a mother, you have interests in business or, you know, exploration in, in different, you know, finances, domains, keep it back to the community, some other area that fuels you. And then when we're in this transition, we can rely on really solid routines, you know, really social support and the connection and those that can like elevate us and, and lift us up into finding the next thing that we can be a part of. And and, and this is why I see a lot of athletes you know, who transition right back into the sport domain of some revenue because it's what their mind knows is what they're good at. They understand the competitive drive. They'll become an analyst. They'll become a coach. They'll find some way to give back into that sporting community because they'll always identify as that. And so it's using your strength of what you know into a different way for you and making new meaning of yourself. Hello, have you ever come across a book called uh, No Hunger in Paradise by an author called Michael Kelvin? No, but that sounds fascinating. (laughs) It's uh, it's based on soccer and they, in the book, it really emphasizes the element of specialization or early specialization um, within elite sport. And they they highlight a range of cases within the book that um, to solely focus on football or solely focus on soccer at a young age kind of impacts the long-term development of a young player. And they mention factors around socialization and burnout and all these other factors kind of become apparent when they have to perform and make it at that elite stage arranges around the ages of like 15 16 17 18 and that transition away as well can be a difficulty in terms of ego and other factors as well so it kind of very much aligns to that check that out one thing that i was going to mention as well is around mental health and mental well-being is there anything that you uh have emphasized or explored within your practices that align with the transition of, of of athletes or even maybe athletes that are in a, a certain pressurized environment is there anything that is a a common theme within 
the practices that you've experienced? Yeah, I mean, I think my whole work as an applied practitioner is mental health and, and mental well-being, right? And and really shifting the narrative that this is something that has to be reinforced as a skill from an ongoing standpoint, preventative in nature, interventions when needed, it is not reactive. And so the work that I do within organizations is developing a language, a commonality, you know, the organizational wellness, right? Providing support um, on multiple levels, I kind of call it a continuum of care. So my direct player care work might be um, working on optimization and core mental skills training, like goal setting, visualization, you know, mindfulness in that nature that allow them to optimize the goals that they have as an athlete. But then I also have the mental health continuum up to mental illness when I have clients that suffer from anxiety or grief and loss or trauma or transitions. Um, you know, I work in a male sport right now, so becoming a father is a really big thing of like the educational component that it can help them with life. And so we create an environment and a space that we have core cultural roots and, and you know, mental performance domains that we strive for as holistic approach across the systemic nature from our first second um, and academy team. So I work with an MLS club in the States and we uh, very much have same language beliefs of what are the core character makeups that we believe in um, that we're actively doing. We're not just saying them. They're not words on a wall, but we live by them. We thrive in them. We bring them in practice plans. Um, and I do educational talks, right? I'll do educational talks um, for athletes to come in and learn before there is ever an issue. Um, and, and it stems from the relationship as well. I think the presence of me being in an environment when an athlete needs something, like I could be there for them. And so I think that also does justice for this, um, where it's a lot of just teaching them the skills to have. So then when something presents itself, they can know how to respond and act quicker and kind of work through things. Is there any differences between team sports or individual sports around wellness? Is there anything that is is, is different or is there common themes? I'm just intrigued on, on your yeah. practices of if, you, if, you, if you've come across anything that is... Yeah, that, that's kind of, great. That is, it has a difference, if that makes sense. Yeah, because I do, you know, I do have a prior practice. And so my work within these teams are all contract based, right? So I contract with, uh, you know, in my last team, I contract with, you know, collegiate football and softball and uh, gymnastics, even, which is a club team, but an individual component, at, you know, and then I have my individual athletes that range from, you know, individual team athletes like baseball players or a golfer, right? Or a swimmer in that nature. And so, the funny part is the competitive mind is always the same. And I always ask, is there a difference between a seven year old and a 55 year old athlete? And the reality is no, it's just the language and the words they use to describe their experience, but they all experience the same competitive stress, the king, the same, you know, fear of failure, fear of evaluation, um, potential like burnout that might happen. And the anxiety and depression is so prevalent in across any domain. Like those are the two key things that we see with mental illness that is strong, um, whether it's full diagnosis or symptomology of that, that our athletes do experience, whether individual or team athletes. The different dynamics that we could express is the socialization and the connections, right? And what we might need to work on in communication and relationships with individual or team athletes. What signs are you looking for then in terms of maybe on, uh, being aware of maybe mental fatigue or mental issues around performance or even away from the the, the pitch, the field, the court, what what kind of things are you looking for then in terms of that process? Because um, I'm sure it's something that you kind of maybe want to look at early to prevent it from growing into a bigger issue. Is there anything that you kind of use in terms of your practice to, to identify maybe some of these factors that might be apparent? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's twofold because you can have an athlete who is striving and is so successful on the pitch, right, or on the court, but in their life, they're struggling. Or we can have the reverse, right? They're struggling in their domain of sport, but they're kind of thriving in life. Um, and then we have the third category where they're just suffering in all areas. And so you do have to look for these markers and these screeners of how is their readiness is what we like to look at, right? So are they sleeping? Um, what's their wellness look like in terms of like, are they coming in like with the same sort of energy? And I look at like their clothing, right? Do they look disheveled and unkept? Are they like coming in? She kids, it sounds like silly, but you kind of know your guys and your players. And it's like, okay, like, how's your, how's your hair today? Like, do you look like you just rolled on a bed? Like, is this normal fatigue from travel? Is this like a pattern that we see that you're really not taking care of yourself? Um, we look for isolation and behaviors of removing yourself more from the group, not communicating as much. Um, are you eating with us? Are you not eating and taking to go and leaving the facility early. 
Um, these are immediate markers. Uh, we also bring in some physical metrics, right? We'll bring in di different aspects to check out where their heart rate and their recovery is, and we can look at the physical metrics. Are they producing the same way? Um, but for me, from a behavioral context, at first things is like, how's your sleep? How's your nutrition? How are you interacting socially with people? What's changed in your routines um, to help me understand where you're at mentally and emotionally? Um, and if you are fatigued or depressed or anxious, um, especially if there's no real key significant like change in their life, if they didn't just have like a baby or they haven't had a multiple pattern of poor performances that we expect to be problematic or weren't traveling and we know that they might be delayed. If there's just a complete difference in the nature of who they are, we want to like jump in. I try to get ahead of things through my relationship and knowing my athletes and understanding like core significant times of year, the patterns where they are for they've had transitions and moves, death in the family, things of that nature. They're very relevant for me to understand what we need to prep for ahead of time, you know, to help them because oftentimes athletes don't understand unconsciously what's going on with them, right? They don't know that the anniversary of the loss of their father's coming up and that's why they're angry and irritable and removing themselves from people. And so it helps me to kind of make meaning of some of the ways that they're presenting. I'm intrigued on, you mentioned um, looking at the physical aspect and how that might correlate with the mental aspects. What kind of things would be apparent in terms of the physical body then? What would be showing in terms of, okay, this person maybe need further support? What, what are you looking at? Like in terms of like physical metrics of like their their high speed running things like that or like omega oh are you talking about like if they're like not showered their hair is uncapped they're dressed yeah so so so, so more in terms of maybe the the, the kind of the, the physical data of of yeah. performance rather than the their appearance I'm, I'm intrigued on what what would what would the, how would that would change and how that impacts the how the men, mental side does impact performance in, in that regard. Yeah, I think when we look at like I said I mentioned earlier about load management, right? When we look at player minutes, how often are players how long have they been playing? How many games have we had in our cycle? Um, what's the travel load been like? Um, in terms of training, right, we use uh, GPS data with Catapult that helps us understand how much they're running, how fast they're running, what's their heart rate. Those aspects give us a lot of the physical metrics where, you know, my job and the work that we work through is very interdisciplinary. So I'm checking in with our trainers, our strength coaches. I'm on the field watching, you know, their interactions and getting data from our sports scientists of like, are they producing at the level that we expect them to? Are they producing more than their standard? Have they produced more over a long period of time? And now we can see that this might just be mental fatigue for them as well. And they're just really tired and they're not recovering on the back end as well. So we look through kind of the whole picture of the athlete. Okay. What, what challenges have you faced during your practice? Is there anything that stands out in terms of some of the challenges that you've had previously, but also maybe the challenges that you are coping with in terms of this area today is there anything that kind of stands out as a as a key catalyst i mean i think holistically it's about time it's about time being brought into the system like um i think even for the work that i do right and an individual practitioner it's up to the athlete to come to me right in my practice and i'm choosing to want to come see me uh when i work in these contracted spaces with not being a full-time employee i'm only there x number of days for x number of hours and so the challenge is, are you around enough when things happen? Things are going to happen, unpredictability in sport. We never know what could happen, right? And so if I'm not there on a day something happens, do we have the relationships built and the standard built and the policy built to have someone coordinate with me and contact me and know that I'm readily there for this support? Um, and I, so I think that, that that is a challenge, especially in the nature of our work, which is based on relationships. And so you do have to be presently around. And, um, you know, I think... I'm very aware of it. I'm cognizant of it. And I try to like establish kind of some of these processes early. Um, but, you know, I could think of one example this year where I had been in the preseason for three days in the beginning and I was going to be three days in the end. And it happened to be the day that I left. Uh, we had an unfortunate tragedy in MLS where a player on a different club um, had, had an accident and it was fatality and he had died. And he happened to be a previous teammate of one of our players. And this shocked the whole league, of course, when you lose someone in the league, like everyone is impacted by death and perspective change. Um, thankfully, you know, our, our head coach calls me right away and t fills me in. And so we've had the processes established of like, hey, I'm a person for support. Let me know. Would it have been better if I, an ideal if I was there? Uh, yeah, of course. Right. But these are the challenges we have when I'm not there. So like we're trying to set up some safeguards of still being around when I'm not around it comes down to money because the investment comes into believing that this is a resource that people should invest in in their clubs and organizations for their athletes and um, we're just not there yet it's not 
at the level yet where somebody is readily there like we have for athletic trainers or strength coaches. It's interesting now you mentioned environment. I was speaking to a psychologist a couple of months back and they mentioned that um, they the, the environment is a challenge for them just for the fact that if a player is seen speaking to a, a consultant or a, a psychologist that they, they're showing some form of weakness if, they, if the people around them see them talking to that person. So it's just interesting how you kind of talk about environment and how that it differs in your sense and how that could be a positive as well as a negative. Yeah, I think it's how you set it up, right? I think through my learned experiences of being in different organizations, I I believe much more in just transparency and opening. And when I got brought into the, the club I work with now, it was much for creating organizational wellness, creating the culture, working with the coaches. And and it really took our, our head coach, our manager to display, hey, like I want her to be a support system for you. She's here for us. I utilize her. I want you to utilize her. And we build the essence around trust and using that language over the word confidentiality, right? It's it's a trusted space, it's a shared space. And um, I could have a conversation on this island just having a cup of coffee, you know, and, the, you know, and it, it means nothing or it means everything and no one's gonna know because we're just gonna have trusted space. Um, it does set it up a little bit hard for me to actually build core relationships with other people in the organization because I'm always seen to be on and I'm always doing the work and so, there's a little bit less of like the humanity of who I am. And so you have to find that challenge of how can I bring in me into the space, knowing all that goes in with the work that I do and, and the openness that people need to have and the vulnerability to, to have these conversations with myself. So there might be people watching or listening to this that are in a position where they might be in sport, but they might be in business or other domains where they want to try and build an open and honest culture within the mental health field and kind of align that with their values and bring that into kind of a workplace or an, an organization environment. What advice would you give to, to those that are trying to do that in, in terms of building a, a, an opportunity to kind of be more open and honest? You mentioned the word holistic around okay. this area. Is there anything that you, you might advise people to do in terms of supporting them within this, within this field? Yeah, I think it's first doing like a needs assessment for for your business and organization, right? Why would you bring somebody in and what's the purpose and service you want them to provide, right? Is it on the continuum care model of optimization and wellness? And so you're going to have different interventions and conversations and educational platforms to help that, right? Preventative model. Um, are you in much more of risk, you know, tolerance and risk management and you have someone to mitigate that. And so you cover the mental illness and that aspect of things. And um, both of those services are different in nature and, you know, have different barriers of how you kind of build in the work. And I think it's once you have your needs of what you want and finding the right person who has the right training and qualifications is very essential. And for me, it's about mental health is health, right? It's no different than physical health. And so if you're going to encourage um, this process of wellness, then you look at holistically, okay, do we have gym or do we have breaks where people can go for walking and exercise and taking care of all aspects of what we're supporting for them um, in top of just learning educational talks and environments for support and um, and really start bringing people in to make it a part of their culture, not just one-off educational webinars every four months, right? Like build this in for people to utilize and be a part of. Do you find yourself having to maybe educate leaders on that because I, I generally do believe that in an organization or a, a club or, or a, a, any other discipline that might have uh, groups of people within that work and collaborate is that mental awareness of mental well-being comes from the top down and mm -hmm. from your perspective it might be something that you might have to okay we, we're trying to build and integrate this awareness however there might be people in leadership positions that might not cater for some of these factors do you ever find yourself kind of trying to inform leaders or people in, in positions of power around the importance of well-being and how that can be relevant to an organization or a performance or a group of people. I'm intrigued on how, how you, if you've ever had experiences along those lines. Yeah, all the time, actually. Um, you know, part of my role with the Association for Sports Psychology, um, we have what we call kind of like a CMPC like task force, right? Now we've kind of changed the name, but the idea is to educate organizations, those in leaders of what the roles and services provide and why they're essential for you to hire somebody. Um, beyond that at a micro level, I've had plenty of conversations with general managers, front office, like looking and searching for bringing this into their system and trying to find the best fit. And that's why I said it comes down to a needs assessment. 
And it comes down to the psychological readiness of the organization as well. It's very easy to want to hire someone who's on the optimization wellness side, the coaching side of things. They can buy into it a little more. It's a lot harder to come in and buy somebody into, uh, we're going to hire a clinical psychologist um, because that seems very already prescriptive and diagnostic and already puts up barriers. And so it comes in with educating the needs, educating the purpose, finding the language and and helping them understand here's what you can get in all of these areas. Where do you want to start? You know, it can be an and conversation. It's not an or where it's one or the other. Um, it can be an and and it's the process of how the organization is ready to do that and then evolve into that. You know, I think when I look at the jobs that I've gotten has been because I've reached out and I've asked to have coffee with people in leaders and educate and through my relationship with them, spark a conversation. Hey, like, would you like to create this position within us? And so it's been very serendipitous on that nature as well of it does require education in organizations to know how this can be successful and impactful for people. The final question, Hillary, what I normally tend to do is get my guests to either look back or forward. But I think because of the nature of the area of what we've explored today, I think it's important to maybe think about where this might go in the future. So if you are to maybe um, look back on your career and look back at your time around kind of mental well-being, mental support, and you mentioned uh, developing cultures and, and, and understanding uh, an educational perspective around well-being and, um, and performance. And where, where do you think this might go in the future? Where do you think this might play out in, in terms of elite sport, but also maybe, again, looking at this further adrift, maybe societal and, and kind of looking at it from a, a broader perspective? Is there anything that you, you think this might go in terms of um, its growth or, or some of the challenges that might be, be apparent as well? Ideally, I hope it mirrors how the the medicine and the sport medicine world has evolved, especially within athletic trainers, right? The needs for not just one athletic trainer, but multiple athletic trainers, um, not just at professional sport, collegiate, but then into high school, right? Like we have so many athletes from youth level up to professional, right? And professional, we know is very minuscule. It's very hard to even make it to that level. So I hope we actually flip the script and we have much more practitioners in a youth sport domain in coaching education, providing um, a psychological wellness curriculum for our coaches as a requirement for them to take so then they can shift that differently and and create a, a different youth culture. And so it's a bottom-up approach that I, that I hope we go to, right? We've been really trying to get in and say, well, if our lead athletes are the ones who are the voices to inspire the need for this, then we can utilize that. Um, but all of the youth that are dropping out at the age of 13, right, what if we could flip that and provide such preventative care and wellness for these youth athletes to then become healthy adults. So I, I do hope the future is really a bottom-up approach for these organizations. Hilary, I just want to thank you for your time. And for for those watching or listening, where can they find you? Where, where can they find you in terms of maybe contact details, presume social media? Yeah, Dr. C Mindset's my Instagram. That's probably the easiest one. Um, or Cops Tip for uh, Twitter. Um, definitely on LinkedIn as well. So you can just search me up and connect me and, and happy to connect and spread knowledge. And if I'm not the best fit, I love to connect to other people. I mean, that's that's what we're about is connecting people to good people. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll put all your contact details in the, the description. So if anyone's listening or watching, they can kind of check you out via that way. I just want to thank you. Um, yeah, good luck yeah. with the old practices and... Uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, appreciate it.